this is Marius, Hi. Dominic NSR. We're going to talk about um, how to analyze cellular basebands um, and how to find bugs in them and about our tool, which is called Firmware, which helps you do this. So, yeah, now that we have slides set up, good morning also from my side, I'm NSR or Marius. So, before we start, we just want to properly acknowledge the full team. The tool, Firmware, has been a multi-year effort between a lot of different people, a lot of different academic institutions, and it's really, uh, really, really a massive team effort, and we really want to shout out to all the people here on the slide. Now, yeah. Uh. Now, without further ado, let's talk about what will be the next 55 minutes or 45 minutes of our and your life uh, if you decide to stay here. So we will talk about basebands and specific cellular basebands. We will look into uh, how to emulate them and why we emulate them. Um, using this emulation, we will look into different exploration capabilities we have with our firmware tool to then start doing the fun stuff. We will look into fuzzing. Um, which ultimately will lead to crashes, which we will talk a lot of it. And then lastly, we will talk about how we used our tool to scale up uh, what we got on crashes. Yeah, so what is this basement? I mean, you all found your way here, so you must know at least that it's interesting. Uh, but just to give a short introduction, um, I, in the beginning, before I started this project with all these fine people, didn't know that a baseband in a smartphone, the thing that actually talks to the cell tower, is its own dedicated uh, processor. Um, so it's completely independent of the application processor, the thing that runs your apps, right, like Android or iOS. Uh, it has its own operating system, usually like a proprietary real-time operating system that just runs. We we're going to go into details, of course, during the talk. Um, but um, the interesting thing is that it speaks all the cellular protocols from way back in the early 90s that you know, like, you know, if, you, if you're ang in anger that you still have edge somewhere, then it's probably still the spaceman processor that runs all of the communication. And it's millions of millions of, or millions at least, of lines of C code um, that are not really looked into by anybody on the outside world like us. Um, and this is what we set out to change. And basebands are super juicy. Um, as I said, you know, they go back way to the 90s where secu when security was not really a big thing yet, you know. Um, we were not really, we didn't know that you could run random stuff when you had a stack overflow. I guess people knew, but I didn't. I mean, I was a kid, but... Um, <laughs> The, the nice thing is that if you think of some um, complex spec, it's probably implemented in the basement. Uh, and it's implemented you know, in a proprietary way and uh, hasn't been looked at much. Like you know, XML parsers, uh, DNS parsers, TLS. Yeah, there's a whole TCP stack, of course, in it, because um, who doesn't want a whole TCP stack? There's a lot of ASIN-1 decoding. And if you know ASIN-1, it's like this binary format that breaks a lot, um, used to break a lot at least. Um, and it's a tempting initial point of entry onto smartphones just because, you know, <laughs> it's right there. It's the first thing that um, receives every message over the air. Um, and there have been multiple bugs if you follow, you know, the security stuff recently on bigger conferences. Um, there was this amazing talk by Natalie who um, found bugs in um, smartphone basements and they were not only exploitable from if you're like next to it with an SDR, but they were exploitable over like the real air, like over the internet. So you needed a phone number to exploit the phone and run code on it. Um, there was this talk by Ahmad, who was also looking into ASN1 and how it was broken in the past. And then there was this talk by the Android uh, red team um, about how to, um, they try to um, secure the baseband and about how bu um, other bugs they found as well. And all of these talks were just this year. So there must be something about the space bands, right? Which is interesting. So let's start from the basic principles and look a little bit about what are these real-time operating systems running on there. Um, in a nutshell, it's an operating system and it has all the things you would expect from an operating system to have, right? There's a scheduler, a timer, some interrupts. It has some notion of processes and at yours usually called tasks. And these tasks can interact with each other via messages. So that's a core operating system in itself. 
the basement air kiosk is responsible for mainly two things. One is to interact with the hardware peripherals, which most of the time will trigger some over-the-air uh, interaction, so some digital signal processors and similar. But also it has, uh, for instance, a shared memory region with the application processor, so with the Android or iOS side of things. Um, basically, yeah, to forward messages and do all the fancy thing we need to do for calling, have mobile internet and so on. What's interesting is that um, the cellular stack, so it's a lot of specifications, but usually the different parts of the cellular stacks maps pretty much one-to-one -to, -one to the different <laughs> tasks. And we have here one, let's say, heavily simplified tasks yep. for a demonstration, to demonstration purposes. All right, so the interesting uh, pieces, of course, are all stubbed out, and this, this would not compile or run. Uh, but just to give you an in, in, in information, this is like every single task that runs in a basement, and there are many, um, would you know initialize bef uh, at boot or whenever the task starts, and then it'll just run forever. It'll just loop, and this message receive function you see here, this blocks, um, and waits for a new message that it will receive from somewhere you know down the stack or up the stack, and then it'll do something with it. So it, if it would be an ASN1 parser, it would you know parse the message and then um, have some outgoing message afterwards potentially or multiple and send these to other tasks in the basement and then the message is owned so it has to free it um, and the the thing that I found interesting or that is very true across at least all basements we looked at is that every single the spec in the cellular um, modem is big um, the cellular spec is big and in the modem you have um, almost a one-to-one -one mapping because uh, between some of the at least all of the different parts of the spec and a task on the other side. And there is multiple layers in a cellular um, spec and the t lower layer task will forward stuff up. The spec, uh, the stack, oh my god, <laughs> sorry, good morning. It's early. Um, and then at some point it'll reach the application processor via IPC. So now if we want to set up and find bugs in the basement, right? There are multiple approaches and um, Initially, when considering this work, we were mostly looking in three, which were over-the-air testing, static analysis, and emulation. There's also a hidden force one, which is just reading the specs. Uh, some people are good at it and doing it and finding bugs by just reading it. Uh, we are not these, these yeah, people. We are not these people, <laughs> and uh, we don't have the endurance to read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. Like These specs are really big. So yeah, one common approach was just over-the-air testing, right? Like set up the phone, ideally in some uh, AF shield environment, and send all sorts of fun messages to it. Um, we discarded this because most of the time we will not see what's going on, right? We send a message, the phone may crash, may not crash, and we have basically no introspection without really digging deeper into hacking the phone to be able to extract those. Um, another approach would be static analysis, so taking the baseband binary and just using some static analysis tools or symbolic execution, you name it. Um, the issue here is that these firmware, the, the cellular baseband firmware, is really, really complex. It has a lot of different code indirections, a lot of initializations, and our experience was that why static analysis may work for some part, like uh, yeah, specific tasks or decoders, like for looking at the baseband in a whole, it doesn't scale enough uh, without giving too many false positives or other problems. So we decided to go for emulation. So trying to basically take the full basement firmware and start it from the first instruction where it should be executed and then execute it all the way to wherever we want to go. And um, that's why we created firmware. Um, it is the first open source basement emulator. Full system basement emulator. Sorry, yes, there's, it's a fine <laughs> yeah, distinction. The, fine. <laughs> the first one that is able to run and boot a baseband from scratch, basically. So you can drop in a binary-only baseband. You don't need source, you don't need symbols. Drop it in there, and it'll boot. Well, um, for those that are supported. Um, we support, <laughs> but we did try it on over 200 firmware images across nine different phone models and two baseband vendors. So the phone vendors themselves may be different, but there's only like five or so um, actual baseband vendors. The ones that we looked at are MediaTek and Samsung Exynos. There's other notable ones uh, such as uh, Unisoc, Qualcomm, and then there used to be Intel, but it got bought by Apple. And then there is uh, also Huawei's own uh, high silicon stuff um, that people also looked at in the past. Um, sorry for if I forgot mm. any baseband mm. vendors. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, let's 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 see how this looks like. How our emulator looks like with uh, our actual baseband. So we pre-recorded all of the demos just to make it you know easier for us. I guess the demo gods. Um, I hope it's somewhat visible today. It's not too sunny, so it should be fine. Right. So we we start firmware, which is our emulator. We give it a modem.bin. The modem.bin file um, is a you know Samsung in this case Shannon baseband that we downloaded from somewhere in the internet. So we downloaded the whole Android image, and then we extracted the modem file from there. This was not in, um, encrypted, which makes it, of course, nice for you know benign firmware analysis like ours. Um, and then you see here that it boots and it logs a ton of stuff. On the very left, you see the timestamp. Then you see the task, um, including you know what the original uh, name was. And then um, you see uh, even the C file where this originated. So this is you know present somewhere in the in the firmware. We need to reverse engineer it to even get these logs in the first place. Um, and then you saw that this BTL task uh, kept um, popping up and the last few uh, executions looked the same. This is because we were in the main loop. So the firmware has fully booted at this point and then just loops around and uh, waits for things to happen. So waits for some communication from you know, the network, which never comes because it is not really connected to anything at this point. Okay, very cool. So under the hood, um, how does firmware work to enable these uh, yeah, millions of log methods just flying by. So we split the framework in two parts. One are the vendor plugins, and the other are, is the emulation core. And the vendor plugins is basically, as the name suggests, specific for every of the um, baseband vendors we looked at. So we have one for MediaTek, one for uh, Samsung, Shannon, Exynos. And basically, the vendor plugin takes this firmware binary and does a full lot of pre-processing. It tries to figure out uh, where the memory mappings. It uses some magic called pattern DB to resolve uh, symbols, uh, which we will need later on. And yeah, once it gathered all this information, it passes on to the emulation core, which then well, does the emulation, so it tries to run the code. And it also emulates uh, the peripheral it needs to interact to a point where, well, the basement runs. So it's not a full truthful emulation, but it helps us to get it running. And it provides us a lot of different introspection capabilities, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit, I think, right? Right. So the vendor plugins um, are a firmware loader. Then we have different CPU architecture support uh, things in there. Um, so MediaTek is usually weird. The one that we support is a MIP 16E2. Uh, the latest 5G ones switch to NanoMIP, which is also weird, but needs extra work to get going. Um, then for Shannon, we support ARM Cortex R stuff, which is also one generation older. The latest one switched to uh, Cortex A, so actually application processor. So next to your application processor, you now have an application processor. Um, <laughs> there's yeah, there's um, some SOC specific, you know, as Mario said, memory mappings, etc. Peripherals that you know the basement tries to talk to, like there would be I don't know an antenna or something or. Um, that anyway, that we just usually stop out. We just want the thing to boot and think there's something. We don't care if it looks real or not. Just real enough for the basement to boot. Um, and then we have you know functionalities for each vendor to recover the basement internal logs. So they're not actually logging all of this necessarily. They just do some proprietary stuff and then have their logs somewhere else. Um, and we like show them, which is nice. And then we have this pattern DB, which is used um, to basically find, so we don't want to hard code everything. So we have this pattern DB. This is how one pattern definition would look like. We have you know, a pattern. It looks a bit like a regex. It has similar functionalities. It's like these bytes, look for these bytes. And then these are like wildcard bytes. Um, there's um, other options in this pattern, like for example, is it required that this pattern exists? Would the is it a, a fatal error if it doesn't exist? So like, you know, the entry entry point or something like that, like the main map of all tasks. If this doesn't exist, then we just don't want to boot. It doesn't work, um, and then we can run some some code as well. Um, and there's not too many patterns needed to get a firmware uh, booting actually. So Samsung uh, we used 18 and MediaTek only nine to get the thing running. And yeah, now we have this uh, pre-processed image uh, from the vendor plugin and plug it into the emulation core. Um, the emulation core, I mean, as we saw, allows us to see all those logs uh, then flying by during runtime. It allows us also to just play around with the firmware via GDB, an interactive console, and it also enables us to do fast testing. 
we built the emulation core using two frameworks. One is Panda, which is a QEMU-based um, emulator which was originally designed for record and replay and reverse engineering. But what it has, it's a lot of nice features to hook into the different parts of the emulation. And also it comes by now as a Python library so we can uh, easily plug it. And the second framework we used was Ava Tattoo which is uh, basically a framework for orchestrating, so basically to tell Panda how to run in similar, and it also allows us to basically stop and implement the peripherals we need. One other functionality provided by the emulation core, which we heavily use, is a mod kit, or the modification kit, which allows us to inject custom tasks. So we can extend the functionality of the emulated baseband by yeah, writing our own code, writing our own AirTOS task for the baseband, and put it into the emulated version of the so firmware. There's a list of all tasks basically in the baseband, and we just at boot time or at any time and we slot another one in there, like in the end. And that's our own task then. Yeah, and then we use pattern DB again to find the symbols the task needs. So we can use uh, actual functionality which is already there in the baseband. Like we can use uh, debu uh, de debug lock functions, or we can use uh, different hooks for allocating memory and so on. So we can really use this mod kit to do a, a full bunch of interesting things. Um, so now let's look at how to explore this. Exactly. So I briefly mentioned before we have the console, which is, I think, what at least I use uh, the most when playing with firmware. And it's basically a Python console which directly hooks us during the running emulation into the emulating process. So we have a reference to the, in this case, the Shannon machine object. So this is a firmware machine which allows us to control the emulation. Like we can start and stop the emulation, we can do breakpoints, we can read or write memory. And all of this is built on top of uh, Jupyter notebooks. Not notebooks, console, sorry. And another cool thing on, the, on top of these um, consoles or integrated in the console is we have our own task that gets injected as well. Like you can write your own task, but we inject um, this G-Link task, which is the guest link task. Um, it's a custom task that we created that basically forwards things from this Python console inside um, the baseband. So you are on the host, you're playing with your Python. You can do, as you can see on the right, you can you know get this G-Link um, handle to this G-Link task on the inside, and then you can call things on this G-Link. So it, you can create blocks. Um, so you can basically allocate um, chunks of memory inside the baseband. You can send ta uh, messages from inside the baseband to other tasks inside the baseband again. You can set events, which is a thing that you know is internal to the baseband as well. You can do like, hey, there's something happening. Um, and then you can also get values out. So you don't need to recompile your, your task and re-inject your task every time. You can basically play around with it from a Python Jupyter console, which is really handy. And then um, another thing that we use heavily um, now in the next demo is basically uh, we have we can snapshot the whole thing at any point in time. So after the, let's say the boot takes a bit, we don't want to, or we we are looking at one specific thing. We don't want to reset the whole thing and reboot to this uh, uh, place every time. Um, and we can take a snapshot. It uses the QEMU internal snapshots and it. Um, has en enrichment with like these peripherals that we write, for example, like if they have a specific state, we can also snapshot this, which is handy. Um, yeah, and let's see how this looks like. Yeah, so here, first of all, we start a TMAX session, which we don't see right now, but we basically need uh, two windows, because in one we will have firmware running, and in the other, our console. So we restore in the very first, or we say that we want to restore a snapshot, which is the one for this demo, and that we want to enable the console. So now we see firmware booting up, and can attach on our second terminal, which we will start here, um, to, um, well, to firmware to our console. And once we are in here, we yeah, <laughs> we're typing. Uh, we can see we have the self object, which is the Shen machine, and we can just say, "Hey, let's emulate for I don't know one second. And we see here some of the messages flying by, so we emulate it a bit. And now we want to show a little bit about G Link or Guest Link. Oh. The demo is broken. Nice. Nice. Uh, demo um, Thank you. Yeah. Anyhow, we got a reference to the G-Link peripheral, and um, 
we try to do create block, so we want to oh, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> think it's uh, resolutions from the projector and so uh, on. It worked yesterday. Anyhow, yeah, anyhow, we create a memory block and we run again because this is an interactive task, so it needs to run to alloc allocate the block, uh, which we have now at this address down here. And um, this is a freshly uh, allocated block, so we just use the read memory functionality to read 40 bytes, the amount of what we allocated. And we see these is all zeros for now, which makes sense. It's a freshly allocated block. So let's change this a bit and uh, <laughs> write some memory <laughs> in a very <laughs> broken up way. And uh, yeah, eventually we write 40 A's to this location. And here we are, it's zero for now as we turn. And if we read it, we have uh, 40 A's there. So this should show a little bit how FilmWire works under the hood. Okay. Sweet. So, um, what can we do with, you know, we can now interact with things in the basement. What, what does that mean? Like, what is a thing in the basement? As I said earlier, you know, the, every single cellular specification is somewhat reflected in one of these tasks. Um, so there is, you know, this is like how, for example, the 2G protocol stack would look like. 2G, of course, is still relevant because it's still enabled everywhere, especially here in Germany. You should know this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, well, there's you can turn it off in more modern phones, but it's it's uncommon that people do that. Um, so you have these different layers in the uh, in the specification, and then there is different tasks. So there is, for example, um, in this case, a CC, which is short for call control task, and a call control task would uh, give you control. Like, it doesn't really matter what all of these abbreviations are. If you have no idea what any of these are, you can go to 3gpp.guru, which is the most amazing website for these sort of things. Just type in the abbreviation. It'll tell you at least the location and spec. You will still probably have to ask ChatGPT for what the spec actually means, but that's a different <laughs> story. Um, anyway, this um, CC task, this call control task, um, it is for the, the task that does everything uh, for circuit switch calling. So in the mo more modern uh, spec, if you call somebody, it's actually just a voice over IP or LTE, voice over LTE call. So like it's only bytes and uh, packets flying around. Back in the day, it was circuit switched. It was already bytes, but it was uh, circuit switched. Um, and there's still bytes sent over the air. Um, and then there is different messages that the CC task will basically eat and do something with it. Um, so there's the CC setup a message that is sent from the network over the air in bytes uh, to the mobile device, so to our basement. Um, and then the packet is made up, you know, if you want to know more like about what bytes we're going to send in the next demo, um, they're aligned with the spec. Um, and then we can actually call ourselves, which is kind of cool. Right. Mm, yeah. Let's see. Let's if do this and hope that it works. Demo gods, let's Dem go. So again, Tmax, we are starting again from the snapshot, and um, attach again to the console. Now here we prepared already the bytes we want to send for this call setup message, just uh, to yeah basically have it ready. So it's what we call here the call init payload or call setup, and these are the magical bytes we got by reading the spec and doing a little bit of reverse engineering. Um, we're getting the guestling task again, or the guestling peripheral. And one little thing we will do here before uh, actually sending the setup message is sending another message to the CC task, which will trigger initialization of the CC task. Because by default, it just spin up, it's booted, but it still would wait for the basement to complete other tasks before uh, being ready to process over the air messages. And yes, finding this was painful reverse engineering. Yeah. And yeah, the magic uh, message for it is uh, just being typed magically in here. Um, the and yeah, we send it, and we can see here uh, if we look a little bit like that. There are a lot of initialization happened, uh, and we saw here that uh, yeah, like initialization functionality oh. is going on. Okay, with this we can now move on and try to send the. Um, <laughs> send a um, call setup message, um, which requires a slightly different header. So these are headers for the messages being changed down here. And then we put the actual payload <laughs> and run the emulation again. And uh, we can see here already here, down here, there's radio message call 
confirmed written, and we can also see a lot of other CC uh, functionality flying by and being used. So we basically now, in quotation mark, called our emulated baseband or gave it a signaling message like, hey, here is a call incoming. Yeah, so there's like, you know, the, some logs that indicate that the baseband has actually received our call and thinks that there's an incoming call. Yeah. So this is what we do when or what happens to the emulated baseband if we send a benign input, which conforms to spec. But what happens if we don't do so? Yeah. So um, what do you want to do if you want to send something that doesn't conform with you know, the thing that something wants to receive? Um, you use fuzzing these days. Everybody probably, or most people would have heard about fuzzing. It's basically you know, throwing tons of input in a somewhat smart way into an, a target until you find some side conditions that the original author of the, the thing didn't, didn't think about. You know, you want to find something like an off by one or some unchecked something where if you just read it, maybe it's too much code and you will never find this, but if you just randomly f throw stuff at it, you'll find it. Um, and how do we do fuzzing in firmware? Um, well, it is so we can do normal AFA plus plus fuzzing basically, but we do it against a full system emulated baseband, which is kind of cool. For this, we have another task. So we had the glink task earlier, where you can type things in Python and interact with the baseband. But of course, this is slow. Um, for uh, fuzzing, we injected a fuzz task um, using our modkit. It um, then will send messages around um, in that come directly from the fuzzer. So basically, it eats something from the fuzzer and then sends it to some task that we want to uh, take a look at. Um, and we have custom hypercalls to get this you know, work, so to get a new fuzzing message. And we have the, uh, the hypercalls will also turn on coverage collection. So the, um, the fuzzer will know if it found new branches in the target task. And uh, for coverage collection, we had to hack Umu a bit, and we injected basically um, this on the TCG level. If you know how Kumu works, it lifts every single, so during um, runtime, it lifts every block it hasn't yet seen into its intermediate language, and then compiles it back down, or SM or whatever, emits it back down into the target architecture. And if when we have this lifted block in our hands, it's basically all of the code, and it's one, it's not one basic block, but it's one translation block, so it's one, code unit. And we can use this to basically um, give, give feedback to the fuzzer that we found something new. So we jumped from some place to some new place. And this edge will be you know, uh, reported back to the fuzzer so that it can uh, store input that found new coverage and then uh, do some mutations in a smarter way for the future. Um, and then we send the message that we received um, you know, from the smart mutation to this basement um, task internally. Uh, for this, we also created multiple proof concept harnesses, else you know, we wouldn't have found bugs, which would have been sad. So let's put this a little bit more into practice and look into how would we write our own harness or our own fast task for a protocol of our choice. In this example, we will basically walk slowly through our CC fuzzer. And for creating your own harness, so call control, what we just saw before, and for creating our harness, one would first to create a new mod, for the modkit, set up the fuzzer using a special fuzz single setup function, and specify what needs to be done during each fuzzing iteration. So for each fuzzing test case, we get out of AFL++. Um, so creating a new mod is kind of straightforward. On the one side, you will need uh, the template, in this case for GSMCC, just using some includes and setting a task name. And then we need to adjust the make file to uh, basically at the CC fuzzer in there, so that it will be compiled as mod, which then gets injected uh, during boot time. Um, so CC again was call control. So this is actually the fuzzer that will, you know, fuzz this call setup that we saw earlier. Exactly. And what the fuzz single setup does is sending the init messages we just saw before in the demo, right? Like recall that. Basically, the task at boot stage is not ready yet to receive over the air input, so we need to send one magical reverse engineered message before, which is what we're doing here with the fast single setup um, function. First, we get the QID for CC, then we allocate a block using the PAL memalloc function. So, this is recovered via pattern DB from the mod kit, uh, via pattern DB, and called from the injected task directly in the firmware, uh, yeah, in the basement firmware. And then we set up, like once we have the block, we set up the message. So we basically set the, um, the op, we set the message group, and so on. And then use Paul message sem2 to send this message we just created to the CC task. 
easy. Now this would be received and the CC task would be ready. So we can continue and specify what needs to be done in a fuzzing iteration. Here again, we start with getting a small block from the uh, baseband with using power mem alloc. And this time we will need some space for the fuzzing input we get. So we just say, okay, let's leave some space for whatever AFL wants to give us. And then we call get work. Get work is one of our hyper calls, which we use to communicate between uh, Panda or firmware and the fuzzer. And get work will just get an input, writes it into this uh, shared buffer, and reports back the input size and the input size variable. Now that we have our fuzzing input, we need to continue and give it somehow um, to the target task, to the CC task. Before doing so, we set again uh, up the how the message looked like, right? Like we set the different header fields and so on, and then copy over the payload we just got from the fuzzer into the message so that we can send it. And this is what we do. Uh, no, first we do call start work, another hyper call which will enable the coverage collection uh, Dominic just explained. In this case, we want to collect coverage from address 0 to address OXFF, FF, FF, FF which is basically all of the memory in a 32-bit space. So we want to collect all coverage. And then we call PAL message send to again to send it over to the target task. And one thing to note here is that we um, modify our, or we compile our um, further task to have a very low priority in the operating system. So when we call PAL message send to, it will actually, or the scheduler will actually schedule our task out and send it to the CC task, which has a higher priority. So this call would basically block, and we only return to our uh, fuzzing task once the CC message was processed. And once we are back, we call done work, another hyper call, which basically says stop coverage collection, we are done here for now, and we can start again in the ne next fuzzing iteration. Right, cool. So let's see some fuzzing in action. Um, what we're going to do now is, so I'm going to show, oh, this is probably going to be, <laughs> let's see, let's see, this may be broken. <laughs> well, you know, you think command line tools would just work, but you know, yeah. it's uh, okay. not so perfect. Yeah, well, we Sad. can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we so what, what you should see is um, basically a normal AFL++ command line. Um, and then you should see, um, can you switch back anyway? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we, we give it basically the fast task, so the, fa uh, the task that we want to inject. When we give it a snapshot, um, that we also uh, want to load from, and then we give it um, add add for you know add add yeah that's the add add <laughs> um, for um, which is if people have used AFL plus plus before it's it's the basic command line that tells the fuzzer give me input to this place like under the hood we actually get the input via shared memory from the fuzzer but it doesn't matter and then um, we're gonna start AFL plus plus um, this is without persistent mode. Uh, so that means that every after every execution, the f uh, the um, target quits, and then we restart the target or we refork the target. So that's why it's pretty slow, but the stability is 100%. We can also use persistent mode, which will uh, make the fast task basically just loop around and ask the fuzzer for the next input, and then we get up to like almost 2,000 execs on a single core, which is uh, decently fast. But of course, then other tasks in the baseband may jump in at some time, so it's not as stable. But of course, it's a pretty good trade-off um, so yeah so it fuzzing works woo <laughs> and then um, <laughs> if you leave this guy running for a short while actually <laughs> yeah, you can also find crashes so the CC task found one critical bug um, that was a zero day at the time uh, we found uh, we also looked into LTE RFC, which is another pre-authentication message, but in the LTE, so in 4G, um, where we also found two critical and one high-rated uh, zero-day, and then we used uh, SM, um, which is another task that has been explored in the past, um, as a ground truth. So in total, we had seven crash crashes deduplicated over all of our fuzzing, and four of them, uh, yeah, were unknown at this point in time. And we reported them to the window. Yes, Maybe they're all fixed uh, by now. That. Yeah, but exactly. So let's do the next demo and just uh, look in how it looks like if we would replay such a crash we found. Right. Um, so we're going to um, start firmware uh, wire again, and we <laughs> we're going to restore the same snapshot that we would have seen in the last demo. And then we uh, use the fast triage mode, which is like fuzzing, but it has more logging enabled. Like we usually disable logging during fuzzing because it's slow. Um, and then we give it the input that the fuzzer found. 
So the fuzzer conveniently named it, no, we na named it crash.bin. And then we run it against the same modem bin. We renamed it to Vuln modem in this case. Um, and then you see in the end that there's a prefetch abort. So it's faulting at a PC. It tries to fetch a PC that doesn't have executable code, which is usually a good, like a bad sign from security perspective or a good if you want to find bugs that may be exploitable. Fuzzers will like it, developers not so much. Yes. Um, okay, cool. And um, this, so to show that these crashes actually work, uh, we also uh, replayed them over the air. So we used, uh, you know, some uh, BTSs uh, for GSM. We used Yate for LTE, RSC. We used OpenLTE. So uh, you know, you can talk to a little SDR, and the SDR will then send our input. Like we patched them to send our inputs that we uh, uh, found that are crashing. And then actually, all of these pre-authentication um, messages also caused you know, a crash in the actual modem. So you see down here, uh, real restart, which means, uh, you know, the radio layer just died and I'm going to restart it. Um, yeah, so which yeah. is, I mean, this is probably the good case because this means that it's just crashed and restarted, which is better than other things that, you know, there's no code being run in this case. Yeah, and I mean, that's all what it means to crash a baseband in that sense. It's not that the phone, like, dies and reboots. It's just the uh, connectivity symbol on the top right will disappear, come back, you will get a little pop-up in the best case. Um, but from an attacker's view, uh, they could go from there and probably exploit the baseband and, uh, yeah, take it from there. And we were not interested in that. Instead, we were looking more into the different bugs we have in a large-scale large context. So we collected a lot of different firmwares, and oops, oops, sorry. Yeah, and um, the idea is we have some ground truth crashing or some crashes which work on the modem we fast. How does it look in the full ecosystem? So if we take other modem images and replay the same crashes, what would happen? So w with the intuition, we could get insights about patching timelines and similar. And we collected for this, like, uh, I think over 200 different uh, firmware images from uh, Mirror, which has the full Android update and extracted the basement modem image file from there. Right. And um, overall, we, we collect 360 uh, firmwares from, you know, between si uh, 2016 and 2021. Um, of these, 131s were duplicates. So we downloaded a new, new Android image, but it had didn't have an update on the modem image, which you know happens. They don't update the modem as often as the main operating system. Um, and then uh, of these, we were able to boot 213. So 16 of them failed to boot. And you know, in the large scale study, you don't really want to look into everything. So probably they just like hanged in something, waiting for some data that we didn't provide in the right way in this case. Um, so and these are the models that we looked at. So a lot of Samsungs um, S7 to S10 and then uh, A41 and A10S. So these are also Samsung phones, but using a MediaTek baseband chipset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, as well. And then uh, on uh, Senodo, you can find actually the whole data set if you're interested and want to replicate our study. Exactly. And here or are our results. Look at our study again, yeah. I guess. No. <laughs> Anyhow, here are our results. And don't be afraid. This figure is overly convoluted and complicated, but we will walk you through it. So first of all, each dot in here is uh, one firmware image, which we downloaded. And on the bottom, we have the timeline. So this is firmware images over time. And on the left, we split up for the different phone models we tested. And this graphics is just uh, uh, Shannon-based ones. And these here are the different crashing inputs, right? So the ones we found during fuzzing. And in this figure, we see uh, when there is a green background behind the dot, it means there was no crash or we didn't observe a crash when replaying the crash. When it was a red uh, background, it is we saw a crash happening. And the grayed out ones is, OK, we had some emulation errors on cold or couldn't access whether there was a crash. But as we were large, we just didn't care. We just looked into what does crash, what does not crash. And I think there are a couple of interesting things to see. First of all, the SM bug we used as ground truth testing. Um, we uh, yeah we basically saw that it was indeed patched for good. It never came back later on any phone uh, after it was initially patched. Um, the CC1 crash we found really affected all the phones, so it was indeed quite a critical vulnerability. And we also happily see that it was patched and didn't occur again. Um, for RC bugs, we see that they are not affecting all bugs, so there are uh, not all phones. Sorry, so there are quite some differences, which 
I think is also quite interesting. And we also see, which I think is one real good outcome of this large-scale study, that sometimes there's missing patch propagation, right? We found this RSC1 bug uh, on the ST and E in the fuzzer, we reported it, and only one year later we did the large-scale analysis and we saw, oh no, on another phone this bug is actually still active and not patched. So we went again and reported it and uh, got it fixed in the very end eventually. Um, so yeah, these are some interesting insights, but let's wrap up the talk. Yeah, yeah thank you all for your... Um, for your time. Uh, so we, as uh, said in the beginning, we ha um, built the first uh, public file system baseband emulation platform. We have cool introspection stuff and instrumentation capabilities that you looked at, including like fuzzing and you know looking around in a baseband. Uh, we have support for MTK and Shannon from back then. Uh, we found multiple bugs, and there's um, probably a lot more. So we basically writing a fast task um, is a manual effort. You have to reverse a ton. Um, and then build your task, and uh, there's probably a lot more um, if you want to look at it. Um, you can go check out our source code on firmware slash firmware on GitHub. Um, we have, you know, it's Docker, so you can easily set it up. And uh, we have documentation, which is a big plus for an open source project, I think. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, we want to conclude our talk. Um, you can reach us via email, and you can you know, go to our repo and ask questions uh, starting now. Thank you so much. Well, you mentioned uh, Cortex-A already as an application processor on top of the application process. Are there any plans to add support for the Cortex-A? Plans, yes. Time, no. <laughs> yeah. PR is right, welcome. We, yeah, we're, we're basically cycling back to this every half a year, doing a little bit more, but never. Uh, as a, as a, as a, by now, just in the state of a hobby project for us, we, uh, yeah. Take, but that being said, we welcome contributions. Um, so they are still. We tried, that's <laughs> why I asked. Ah, okay. I mean, we can think and try to make it happen, right? <laughs> and a uh, second question. Don't know if it's allowed. Um, how did you get started on this? Did you first read the specs? Did you first try to reverse? Did you? For me, it was first starting the reverse engineering. Same. And, yeah. yeah, I have and no idea about yeah, specs. I, I learned specs during looking at binary inputs. Yeah. I think so did somebody else on the team have a lot of time to read the specs? Or? Yes, in the end, we had some people in the team which were really knowledgeable about the um, about the specs and also when we were stuck, we were looking at things together and then they came just up with, oh, hey, that could be this and this according to that and that spec. And yeah. I mean, and the main main question, which is Im interesting and can only be solved by looking at the spec is which uh, tasks are actually accessible over the air, right, without authentication or which are more critical than others. For this, you need some knowledge about, you know, spec specification. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, I'd, lo I'd love to have some insights about how much time and effort w went into the, all of this work. Like, how much, uh, how many years have you all been working on this? No. And uh, <laughs> uh, yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, so I, I, I think I so Grant, I think started working on this mid 2019, and I joined in in around winter 2019. So and uh, then it took, I think, until early 2022 before we had the public release of yeah. the tool. Um, by, I say 2020, I think we had a proof of concept uh, kind of working only for Shannon, very rough, but at least it was running and emulating, which was cool. And I think the uh, main milestone, but then yeah, fuzzing and increasing on this took also considerable amount yeah, of time. And then I started also looking independently into MediaTek stuff in 2019 as well, or 18 even though. Mm -hmm. It definitely, uh, there was some way to go. Um, don't start this from scratch, I guess, but. Uh, <laughs> I mean, by now there are probably also uh, like better full system emulation tools around um, that make may make it easier to, you know, like yeah. all of the fuzzing stuff at least is kind of solved now. Yeah, and also yeah, for perspective, early 2022 we released the framework, and just yesterday we pushed version we 1.1.0. Yay! <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Uh, could you tell us sort of roughly what 
typical firmware security looks like on these baseband uh, processors? Like you mentioned encrypt encrypted firmware, but I imagine there's signatures and things of this sort. So yes, um, some vendors do encrypt the firmware. Almost all vendors uh, sign the firmware so that you cannot just modify it and so on. But beyond this, runtime defenses I are... Don't by the way, I don't think encryption would be a security feature, right? But it's just me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so signature checking for preventing you from running your own baseband firmware, which I guess makes sense. And uh, then runtime uh, security protections are, I would say, a bit lacking behind for what we know from desktops. We have uh, basically no <laughs> ASLR. Uh, like yeah. we have uh, uh, some one. some sort of heap cookies, which are always in the Shannon example, which were just one static string, similar with uh, Airtos stack, so not function stack cookies, but cookies for the full stack, which were static initialized to one value. So it's a bit uh, stuck in the past. But I hear there are great efforts uh, to improving it. Yeah, I mean if, you, just, uh, if you look at yeah. the um, Android Red Team talk on uh, Black Hat, you see that uh, uh, you know, at least on Pixel, they're working on uh, getting this improved. But yeah, back, back when we looked into it, there was basically none. Um, how do you reverse engineer the <coughs> format of the IPC, is that easy or um, how do you go from a crash to the actual radio message? So you have the different tasks, but do they actually just send uh, the content of the next layer to the corresponding task or is there something more complicated going on? Yeah, usually a uh, task takes in a message, does some unwrapping and maybe a little bit processing and then takes the rest which needs to go more up and Tenses on up, and it all uses. I mean, in most cases, it uses the same or at least very similar function for doing the message sending, and then for processing, you basically see how this message is processed, and you can use this to infer uh, the C structure which this message should have had. And uh, once you created your types for that, it gets all a little bit more I easy mean, to see. The tasks that we looked at were all, you know, accessible over the air with bytes, so it was not that hard. And they would forward it internally to other tasks as well during fuzzing because it's a full system um, framework, so that makes it a bit easier. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, if you look into an internal task and then you will have to craft some message that would probably be, r be more you know, harder than what we did. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is there any work to extending this to other baselines like the Qualcomm or uh, other vendors? Yeah, so with the Qualcomm, there's one main roadblock at the moment that Qualcomm baselines use a custom instruction set architecture, and the tooling for this is a bit lacking behind, right? So without having a full system emulator for Qualcomm baselines, we cannot, uh, or um, not a full system emulator for Hexagon in general, we cannot build on top of it with our tooling. Um, yeah. And the, yeah. The only thing you can do with Qualcomm right now is um, use libafl q uh, QEMU to do basically a single task in users users user mode QEMU. Uh, user mode QEMU. There's a public um, implementation in you know QEMU upstream, um, and then libafl QEMU can actually fuzz these single tasks. But then of course you don't have all of the flashy full system interaction between tasks and things. How do you interface with your simulated hardware? Do you intercept the API calls or emulate the register level access? We emulate the register level access. And yeah. And and I mean, we stop a lot, right? In some cases, like it, when peripherals need to initialize, we don't really care what's going on. Most of the time, the firmware will just check, like it writes something, we discard it in our emulator, and then it will check is this bit uh, set to one which indicates uh, uh, that it was initialized. So we are, we are lazy and just created a cyclic bit peripheral which on every read access would return another bit set <laughs> and eventually it, it, it like it once right we had bit. this simple approach we booted I think 90% of the different peripherals. <laughs> And yeah, some of course need a bit more work and more uh, more reverse engineer and specifically timers. I still have nightmares about reverse engineering timers. <laughs> Um, from the demos, it looked like you always use a specific snapshot. Has there been like selection process of, of selecting snapshots that you want to use? And because it was perceived as runtime and fuzzing on the runtime, but um, did you prepare a specific 
yeah. snapshot? So the snapshot heuristic we used was quite simple. We saw in the first demo that at some point it was looping and scheduling in the same task. We took this address which from the BTL task, which is not important, but we saw this address and just say, okay, here's a modem world expect things to happen, so let's snapshot there. And then, yeah, we went from there. Yeah, so it's m mainly to skip over the initialization for this. Like you could mm. use snapshots deeper in the stack somewhere where some ra uh, site conditions have already been met, but we didn't do that yet. In the combination with fuzzing, I mean, if you can proactively, like you have discovered a new branch, you make a snapshot, right? It's a very powerful mechanism yep. to just start from uh, something where you have done most of the work and you're just looking. And then you're saying like, okay, this branch, I want to get here and set out the fuzzer to, to get towards the target with solve us or something. Yeah, I mean, you could uh, do this, right? You crea could create a manual harness, which first and then snapshot mm. or yeah, yeah. Really like nice. you could automate it we we haven't done it yet pandas is a good choice <laughs> <laughs> great that we have so ma uh, many questions unfortunately i have to give the last question now hi uh, the trick where you're like scheduling your fuzzing task and task with a low priority is cool and cool but did you run into cases where essentially you're stopping too early or like the thing you're triggering is very asynchronous, but like your fast task has already stopped and it doesn't get executed anymore. Not to not we're not aware of that. I don't think that happened because we're really like we're the lowest possible priority, and every call control stuff is higher priority. So the schedule will always just schedule everything higher than um, us. And so also another thing is uh, persistent mode, right? We implemented this persistent lock at some point. So basically, persistent mode. The work would be done, and then the next fuzz iteration, like the basement continues, the fuzz task gets scheduled in, sends the next input. By then, maybe side condition happens. Right. Uh, triaging gets a bit messy at this point, but uh, cold in theory will be done. Right. So essentially, every message is like always processed instantly, and there's not like a queue where some task checks it periodically or something like that. Not mm -hmm. in the stuff we looked at. Probably that can happen, but then you will have to find some way to. Yeah. Yeah, right. but, um, but I mean, one one thing to say is also we specifically looked into pre-authentication messages because this is uh, I, like one of the most lucrative attack targets, right? Because just taking as is, and usually pre-authentication there is not a lot of state yet. Yeah, and you don't. I mean, the cool thing about pre-auth stuff is that it's it's simple, and you don't need any um, like. Yeah, uh, you can just send this as a rogue base station. You don't need to be uh, in any case like um, a proper benign. Um, cellular person or uh, yeah, any vendor. Um, anyway, you see my brain is already fried. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Yep.